Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So what is December 4th today? Very sad day. The last class of the semester. I'm sure everyone is very upset about that, right? <laughs> well, okay, well, maybe you're not as upset as I am. Um, deflectometry and Scott's last class. I made, we made a few comments about that at the beginning of class. And I said I thought they were different. Well, there were, it turns out there are two different ways of doing deflectometry. There's a, the technique that uh, I've known about for a long time, where you would reflect a beam off of a specular surface. You send the beam through a Ronchi ruling. And then uh, some distance away, there's a second Ronchi ruling. And you end up with a moray pattern that gives you slope information about the surface. But as you mentioned, there's another form of deflectometry, which does turn out to be the same as Scott's. And unfortunately, it's been around a long time. So while I thought Scott's was really new, it's only the name that's new, I guess. <laughs> and the technique is not that new. Nothing new in the world of optics, I guess. So, homework problem. You know, the best way to study for the final exam is to work a lot of the homework problems that were not assigned. And so I've decided that today I'm going to post on the uh, 513 website the solutions to all of the, the homework problems. So they'll be up there sometime today. It won't take me too long to do that. And the final exam, does anyone know when the final exam is? What is it? Tuesday. Tuesday, a week from today, December 11th. What time in the morning? 8 a.m. How long does it last? Two hours, okay. And where is it? Here, in this room. Oh, great. Okay, good. Everyone knows. So it will be, a, you know, similar to the uh, midterm. It will be closed book, no notes. Um, the problems will be similar to, um, well, you have a, an old exam to look at, similar to that, similar to the homework problems, and so on. And I always try to make it easy to grade, because I hate grading final exams. But uh, anyway, we'll see. One way to make it easy to grade is to make it so hard that no one can do anything, and that makes it very easy to grade. And the other is to make it so easy that everyone gets 100. Now, we can't do that, so I guess it's something in between. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the testing of systems, and we're talking about um, optical transfer functions. And I, I know you've had OTF and other courses, uh, but I'm going to start out by saying a little bit about what OTF is, and then we're going to look at um, three different ways of doing OTF measurements. And I'm going to give a kind of a physical description of, of what OTF is, and I'm going to try to convince you that a lens is nothing but an interferometer. So what is OTF? So I, I have three PDFs I'm going to show you today, if I can get to them here. And they're going to be a little hard to, to read. I understand that. Um, but you have them in the, in the, uh, on the website, so you can download them. And the first one is, I mean, this is stuff that you, you all know, and it comes straight out of Goodman's book, Introduction to Fourier Optics, just saying what, what is the, the OTF. And so we have that we're, to get the image, we have the object, which I'm actually going to write as a geometrical image, so I don't have to worry about magnification, whatever. And you can involve that with some... Uh, intensity point spread function. And we could take the Fourier transform of the geometrical image and uh, we'll normalize that and do the um, Fourier transform of the actual image. And so we get a, a G sub G for a geometrical image, capital G sub I for the individual image. And um, so this gives you the spectrum in both the object and in the image. And um, 
the OTF would, would be given by the ratio of the two, but it's really then just turns out to be the, the Fourier transform of, and we're talking about incoherent transform, incoherent um, uh, transfer function. And so it's just the Fourier transform of the intensity point spread function. And where we normalize it so at zero spatial frequencies, um, it will become unity. And we have here that the, um, from just from the correlation theorem up here, that the um, spectrum of the image is given by the, uh, this transfer function times the spectrum of the object, or as I say, the spectrum of the perfect geometrical image. So this is a, uh, this transfer function is a complex function. And so it has both an amplitude and a phase. And the, the amplitude of this, the modulus of this, we call the MTF, a modulation transfer function. And um, so again, the OTF is just a normalized Fourier transform of the point spread function. But if we look at, at what we have up here, we can rewrite this. Uh, we can relate the OTF to the pupil function. And it's given by the Fourier transform of the point spread function. And the point spread function is the square of the absolute value of the Fourier transform of the pupil function. And so uh, from the autocorrelation theorem that you probably all had a dream about last night, the uh, uh, transfer function is simply going to be um, given here by a, uh, a convolution of the of the pupil function here that we can rewrite down here. It's just the OTF is the autocorrelation of the pupil function. And so we may make use of that when we, when we measure the, the OTF. I know general properties here, the, by definition, the, at zero spatial frequencies, the uh, transfer function is one. And uh, we're taking the Fourier transform of the intensity point spread function, so it's a Fourier transform of a real function. So the Fourier transform is Hermitian. And um, uh, I mean, as a way of showing this using a Swartz inequality, but I never bother doing that. I just think just by knowing that the OTF is given by the autocorrelation autocorre of the pupil function, we know that um, uh, the uh, magnitude of the MTF here is always less than or equal to uh, the MTF at zero spatial frequencies. So you, you've had all this in other courses. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what does the OTF mean, and then I want to go into kind of a physical um, description of, of OTF. And so if we have some object that's just a, a sinusoidal object, so it's written as 1 plus m sine and nu x, a nu being the spatial frequency. And if I assuming, uh, I'm going to assume unit magnification. So I can write the sine as e to the i nu x minus uh, e to the minus i nu x and m over 2i times that. Um, the OTF here, or they should say the uh, OTF is given by the MTF times e to the i, whatever the phase factor is, and that's Hermitian here. And so the actual image then, if this is the object, the image then would just be 1 plus m over 2i, what we have before. And then we get a term here, which is the MTF. And then we, and here, we just get e to the i nu x, but we get a phase factor. And e to the minus i nu x and a phase factor. The phase factor coming from the, from the OTF, and it's a function of, of frequency. So what we have then is that the MTF simply reduces the modulation of the image. And the reduction depends upon the spatial frequency. And what the phase does, and we often just kind of forget about the phase of the OTF, but what the phase does is, is it shifts um, the image where the shift is different, or can be different, for spatial, different spatial frequencies. So even though the MTF might be good, you know, if you're shifting the different spatial frequencies at a different amount, you still can mess up the image. And so not only is the MTF important, but 
the phase of the OTF is also important. So do you understand just what the phase does here? Now it turns out, in most cases, the phase doesn't amount to much until the MTF is small. It just turns out that way. But you may have cases where that's not true, and uh, in which case you can have a good MTF and still have a messed up, a messed up image. So just remember that the shift here, the spatial frequencies components, depends upon the spatial frequency. Okay. So that, again, if you go back to a book like Goodman's book, you get a good uh, go through that in, in maybe more detail than that. So let's go on here and think more about what what the OTF is and how it comes about and so on. So here I just uh, I went to my Web Mathematica website and I just put in a certain amount of aberration here and you know here's your wavefront map and here's your so you, you uh, take the wavefront you do the Fourier transform and square that and you get the point spread function and then you take the Fourier transform of that well here's the point spread function again slices through it and you take the Fourier transform of this and take the modulus of that, and that gives you the, the uh, MTF. And the, the red line here is what you'd have if you had no aberration. And, you know, since the aberration is not rotationally symmetric, we, hmm, I know, what aberration does it look like we have? Coma, okay. Um, it's not rotationally symmetric. And so the, when we do slices through the uh, transfer function, we'll get, uh, you know, different modulations depending upon whether it's X profile or, or Y profile. So what what is the physical meaning of the OTF? And so here's my lens, okay? And I have light going through the lens. And if I, if I pick two points in the lens, say separated by a distance S, I can think of a, a Young's two pinhole experiment. And I get fringes over here. And if I let capital delta be the spacing of the fringes, um, we would have that S delta over F is equal to lambda. So this just interference, you know, two pinhole experiment. And so for points separated by a distance S here, the spacing of the fringes we would get would be given by this equation here. And the, the spatial frequency is just 1 over the fringe spacing, so it's 1 over delta. And so um, the spatial frequency of these fringes would be S over lambda F. Okay? So the first question might be, what is the largest, the largest spatial frequency you can get? Well, that would be for light coming, you know, from the two edges of the lens. The farther the S, the larger S becomes, the higher the spatial frequency. And so the highest spatial frequency in this image just is a result of light coming from the two edges of the lens here. And so if the lens has a diameter D, the largest spatial frequency, I just put in D here, is d over lambda f. So it's 1 over lambda f number would be the cutoff frequency. And that's only, <coughs> that's only coming from light going through the edges of the lens here. So you buy that? So it's easy to calculate what? the cutoff frequency is. Now, if I think for a second, you know, if I, if I have a S that's smaller than D, I have uh, many pairs of points separated by S. While when I go to the cutoff frequency, I have only one pair of points separated by D. But if I go to a, you know, separation here smaller than D, I'm going to have many pairs of points that will contribute 
to that spatial frequency. And in fact, the smaller S is, the more points I will have contributing to that spatial frequency. So if we go back here and look at the theoretical curve, we have no aberration. Oops, if I can. If we have no aberration here, I mean, that was a shape of the red is a shape of the MTF for no aberration. And it's higher for lower frequencies. And as we get to higher and higher frequencies, it becomes lower. And that's simply because at higher frequencies, S becomes larger. And I'm going to have a smaller number of points with that separation in the pupil. So that gives you maybe a little feel for why the aberration-free curve looks like it does. And if I had a, a square pupil, not many lenses are square, but if I had a square pupil, uh, it turns out this aberration-free, at least for across the pupil, would be a straight line. At the diagonals, it's a different story, but along the, just across the pupil, it would be a straight line um, because you'd have a linear relationship between S and the number of pairs of S. That's not quite true for a circular pupil, so this is, is not quite a straight line anymore. So do you understand why you get a curve like that, like this red one, for the aberration-free case? So now what happens when I have aberration? Well, if I have aberration, then I'm going to have some, probably, some phase difference between here and here, between these two points separated by S. And probably that phase difference will depend upon which points I'm picking across the pupil. And so as I, you know, I take these two points separated by S and I move them around the pupil, probably the phase difference between the two points will be different depending on where the two points are. And so if I change the phase difference between here, that's not going to change the frequency of the fringes, but it's going to change the location of the fringes. You know, if I have no phase difference here, right there would be a bright fringe, but if I had a pi phase difference between these two, that would be a dark fringe. And so if I have aberrations, as I add up all these fringe patterns from coming from these two points separated by S, as I move these two points around, the fringes are going to shift and they're going to tend to wash out. And so that's why if I have aberration, the curve is going to drop down below the aberration free. So I, I guess I say that here, aberrations would cause fringe position being different for different pairs of points of given S and hence reducing the fringe contrast. Okay, so you buy, everyone buy that? So do you understand kind of a, you know, forgetting about all the math other than the, I mean, maybe a simple equation here for the spatial frequency of the fringes, but forgetting about the convolutions and all that stuff for your transforms, do you see physically what is happening here? And have I convinced you that a lens is nothing but an interferometer? You have a, you have, you know, a whole bunch of pairs of two pinholes in here giving you fringes, and these fringes make up the image. Okay? Any questions on this slide? Okay, one more. We I mean, we have cutoff frequency here, which depends upon the spacing between the points, the largest spacing we can have, depends upon the wavelength, and of course depends upon the distance from the lens to the image. And if I go to a lens, you know, this was for a case where I had collimated light coming in, the 
image was in the focal plane. But I could have a lens here where I'm, uh, I have a, an object over here. And I don't know if I can't read that too well. I guess that's I1. And, well, maybe it's L1. L1 and L2. And so in image space, my, I just look at the highest spatial frequency fringes I can get. And so that's D over lambda L2. Oh, I have a mistake here. That should be an L2 right there. Should be a 2 there, not a 1. So that is um, D over this distance, L2, lambda L2. And if I think of it in object space, then that spatial frequency simply corresponds to d over lambda L1. Okay. So you can think of cutoff frequency in either object space or, or image space. Okay. So now you have a hopefully a pretty good idea of what, oops, uh, you know what. MTF and the phase of the OTF does to the image, reduces the contrast of the image, phase shifts to different frequency components, and you have a, a pretty good idea of physically what's happening here and how you're just getting pairs of points producing interference fringes and, and um, uh, gives you what the spatial frequency of the fringes would be, gives you what the cutoff frequency would be, and it tells you, you know, if I have aberrations, that the, the fringes are shifted depending upon where this pair, these pairs of points are. And so that causes the MTF to drop. So let's talk a little bit about measuring MTF. And there are many, many ways of doing it. And I'm only going to talk about um, a couple, uh, two or three ways of, of doing it here. Scanning methods, and I have to go back, I hate doing this, but I have to go back to the um, PDF, and I have to pick the right one. I mean, one way of doing this um, is simply you could, if you had sinusoidal gratings, I could image these gratings I measure the modulation of the original grading, and I measure the modulation of the image, and the ratio here will give me the, the MTF. Um, and so just saying we have gratings of different frequencies, and we can scan the images with a slit, or equivalently, we could image a slit and scan that image with the grating. So either the slit can be the source or the or more typically, we think of the grading as being the source. And in one dimensions here, we just have the, um, the image of the uh, uh, line source. And we're going to um, combine that here with the, um, the object. And if we let the object simply be a, a cosine grading here, and we go through here and we look at the image that we get, we can think of getting um, a cosine Fourier transform of the line spread function or a sine Fourier transform of the line spread function. And that simply um, gives us then the uh, information that we need for both the MTF and the phase of the of the of the MTF here that the transfer function of the MTF would go a square root of some of the squares of these two and the phase here would just go as the arc tangent of the uh, uh, sine transfer function divided by the cosine transfer function and so um, the whole point is that we just we get an image of this grating the modulation is going to be reduced, and the position of the grating is going to be shifted, and the position, the shift of that grating will give us information as to what the, the phase of the OTF is. So just take a grating, 
you know, image it, scan it, uh, and uh, measure the position of it, and measure the, the contrast of it. And that's a, there are lots of different instruments that are sold that would work like this for measuring um, the MTF, OTF. Now, probably a more common way nowadays is simply to calculate the OTF from, from the interferogram. And so you would take the interferogram, you, you find the wavefront, you take the Fourier transform of the wavefront, you square that, and that gives you the intensity point spread function. And then you take the Fourier transform of that, and that would give you the OTF, the modulus of that Fourier transform would give you the MTF. So this is probably the, the most common way. This does not take into account any stray light in the system. It's just looking at the wavefront aberration. Uh, this is generally done only at a single wavelength also. And um, sometimes you want to know what the uh, MTF is at, at uh, uh, over some spectrum. And so that would be a, a limitation here that you'd, you're just getting it at a, at a single wavelength. The other technique here, which is a technique that's not, I mean, I'll say it's well known, but maybe not widely known, is that um, we can get the OTF by taking the autocorrelation of the pupil function. Okay. Well, we can do that mathematically, but we can also do it experimentally. And so, uh, I mean, mathematically, we, we can do that by finding the pupil function with the interferometer, and then we use a computer to, to find the autocorrelation of the pupil function, and we get both the phase and the magnitude. And as I said before, this, just like uh, the other previous technique, it doesn't take into account any scattering in a system. It only accounts for the wavefront aberrations and the pupil shape. And again, as I said, this is only at a, at a single wavelength. But there's a way to measure this autocorrelation directly. And this is something, as I said, is well known, but probably not widely known. And it's, we'll, we'll go through a little math in a minute to show how this works. But it's basically that a lateral shear interferometer can be used to measure the autocorrelation of the pupil function. And it can be shown, in fact, we're going to show it, that if two interfering beams and a lateral shear interferometer have the same intensity, make, to make it easy for us, we'll do that, that the total flux in the interference pattern is given by some number out in front times 1 plus the MTF times a cosine. We're going, some way, we're going to have the shearing interferometer, and we're going to vary the phase between the two interfering beams. And we're going to get something that goes as 1 plus the MTF times the cosine of the phase that we're varying minus the phase of the OTF. So that is kind of neat, actually. So we're going, to, we're going to try to make an instrument where we vary the shear. We're going to have shearing in a front. We're going to vary the shear. And we're going to vary the phase difference between the two interfering beams. And we're going to, as we vary the phase difference, you know, the, the intensity in the overlap region is going to go light, dark, light, dark, and so on. And by measuring the total amount of light here, and also looking at the phase of that modulation, we can determine the OTF. And um, um, well, I think I'll go, I'll come back to this slide, but let me go to the PDF again, a different PDF. Somehow, I just, I think this technique, I don't know, I love shearing interferometers, so I guess that's maybe why I like this technique so much. So as I said, you know, this technique is, is well known. It was first described by H.H. H. Hopkins back a long, long time ago, 55, 1955. But it's not widely known, I guess I would say. And so uh, 
we said, well, the one-dimension OTF uh, is given by the autocorrelation of the pupil function. And so I try to write that here. And um, we had our relationship between spatial frequency and uh, you know, uh, point separation between points in the pupil is S over lambda C sub I. So S is going to be my shear. So I'm going to write, rewrite this as a shear over the diameter times 1 over lambda F number. So it's the same thing here. Um, and I'm going to, for, to make life simple, I'm going to make the uh, two interfering beams have the same intensity. And we're going to let little delta here be the phase difference between the two sheared beams due to the path difference in the interferometer. And in a minute, a few minutes, we'll look at a, a nice interferometer for doing this. Um, and we're going to say, well, let delta be uh, omega t plus some initial phase. So it's going to vary um, at constant rate with time. So if I think here, I'm going to take my uh, shearing interferometer. So I have the two beams. And uh, there's going to be some shear between them. Shear will go from 0 to whatever the diameter is. And so we have these two um, beams. And they have the, some phase associated with this. And there is a phase that we introduce some way in the interferometer. And I'm going, to look, I'm going to integrate over the total intensity. So I'm just taking all the light and focusing it down on a detector, integrating over all the intensity here. So <clears throat> I can rewrite that. Um, um, so I will have this here, which will uh, just be the, uh, the pupil function uh, absolute value squared. And then I have the two interference terms that we have normally in interferometry. And so uh, one beam times you know, complex conjugate, the other beam, and then we have this phase that some way we're introducing. And we're integrating that over the pupil. And then we have the complex conjugate here, uh, which I didn't write out. But we write that over the pupil. And if you look at that, I mean, that is nothing here but the OTF. Okay. And we have, so we have the, the it's just the autocorrelation of the, of the pupil function here. And so if I vary s, the shear, I'm going to be determining the modulation of the OTF, the MTF here. And I'm going to have something here that's going to vary with time as I change the phase difference between the two beams. And that's going to have some phase associated with it that comes from the, from the OTF. Okay. And um, I mean, that's simply it. And so what we can do, and I think this is pretty, going to be pretty cool here. Go back to here. So this was a, a paper that Donald Kelso put together. Um, and what he, he was measuring, um, boundary layer turbulence in an aircraft. But he just had a beam of light coming in here. And so he wants to measure, you know, some optics out here, or whatever. He wants to measure the OTF associated with this system here. And so the interferometer he made here was a little triangular interferometer. So one beam would go around this way. And out, and the other beam goes around this way, and and out. So he has two beams here, and in here he has a parallel piece of glass. <coughs> and you can show here, and if you go back to his old paper, you can see that as I rotate this. I'm going to introduce some shear between the two beams. 
And also what will happen is I will, it turns out if these two beams are going through here at different angles, it will turn out that as I rotate this, I will introduce a path difference between these two beams. And so rotating this changes the shear and it changes the path difference between the two beams. And now he takes this and he focuses the entire beam onto a detector. So as he rotates this, you know, you have the two pupils that are kind of are moving apart, okay, varying the shear. And you have a, the phase difference. And so what he will get here will be something that's varying pretty fast because of the phase difference introduced between the two beams. And the total amount of light here, so the envelope here, would measure out the MTF. Okay. So does anyone understand this well enough you can explain it back to me? Why is the spatial frequency set? Why is Well, spatial frequency is as he's, you think of you have your pupil and you're in a shearing interferometer, so you're shearing the, you know, two versions of the pupil. And so you're interfering points separated by a distance s. So maybe I'll just, you'll see how great I am at drawing round circles here. Okay, so here, you know, for one particular shear, this is what we have. And so we have a shear here of, I'll call it S again. And so what we're doing, we're interfering all points in that pupil separated by a distance S. And we can go back then to relate from S, we can relate that to what the spatial frequency is. Now, if, if there are no aberrations present, then this is going to be a uniform fringe over the region of overlap here. And as it rotates, you know, the plate is introducing this high frequency phase difference between the two beams. So that would just oscillate light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. But if we have aberrations present, then there's going to be some intensity variation across here. And when we're measuring the total amount of light falling down here, there will be less light. Then if, it's, if everything is in phase here, there will be a certain amount of light falling on our detector. And if we have some aberrations present, there will be a less amount of light falling on the detector. And so simply by measuring the amount of light, the modulation of the signal, maybe I should say, the modulation of the signal here as a function of shear, we map out the MTF. So I like this in that, I mean, it gives you a way of using the lateral shear interferometer to measure MTF. But it also, if you understand how this works, you really, I think you really understand MTF and how it works in, in forming an image. So do you understand this? Because uh, I love to ask a final exam question on this. I don't know if I will or not, but I'd love to. Correlation. Yeah, it's performing an autocorrelation. Uh, <clears throat> the um, shearing interferometer is an analog computer, I guess, it's a, in a sense. Okay. <clears throat> well, the kind of a, a, a problem here, well, I mean, this works very well. 
But if we think here for a second, <clears throat> the spatial frequency, well, it depends upon S, but it also depends upon wavelength. And if I really wanted to use a lateral shear interferometer to measure white light, measure the MTF for white light, I'd have to have a shear that was proportional to the wavelength. Because at any given time, I'd want S over lambda to be the same for all wavelengths. So when I think of a lateral shear interferometer, where the shear is proportional to wavelength, what can you tell me one component that might be in this lateral shear interferometer? A diffraction grating. Because remember, for diffraction gratings, you're going to get a diffraction angle that's proportional to to uh, wavelength, and so you'd get a shear that's proportional to wavelength. So at the time when after I read this, I got to thinking about different ways of make of doing this with diffraction gratings. And I'm not going to talk about them here in this class, but there are, uh, there are some very good ways of using diffraction gratings to make uh, lateral shear interferometers that are also very good for measurement of, uh, of, of MTF for white light. OK. Any questions on MTF, OTF? Well, I have just, I think, three slides left or something, and then um, you have evaluations today to fill out. And we're going to close early today, which probably will upset you too, that class is going to be short. Kind of closing remarks. I think we said some of this right at the beginning of the semester, but let's repeat it here. That you know, if you're going to make optics, you really do have to be able to test the optics because you can't make optics any better than what you can test. So, so uh, it's important to know how to how to do the testing. And we also said that you know, if you're going to purchase optics, you need to test the optics you buy to make sure the optics meet the specs. Now. You probably, most of you have purchased some optics. Have you tested it when you got it? Did it meet the specs? No. Did it? Sometimes it does, but often it won't. But as we always say, you know, if you let the supplier know you're going to test the optics when you receive them, you'll probably get uh, a lot, a lot better optics. So anyway, I'd like to, to thank you for taking the course. It's, uh, I hadn't taught it in... I don't know, four years or something like that. It's fun to, fun to teach it again. I like it because you have, you know, you have physical optics, you have geometrical optics, you, you get to play with computers, and, and it's kind of a lot of, uh, of interesting um, topics to, to talk about here. Any questions before we close? And so I, I need a volunteer. We, we have this evaluation to fill out. Oh, okay, good. You know what you you know what you're volunteering for. You're gonna you'll collect these from everyone and then take them to the academic programs office. And so you have homework to hand in and old homework I'm trying to get rid of. And let me hand these out. <clears throat>